All right, we're recording. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Holly Amaya, and I'm here with my business partner, Anne Marie Hoftailing, and together we are Story and Printing. Um, we hope that you are all having a great start to your week. We do these webinars once a month to kind of give everyone a taste of how we train our, our content, uh, how we are different. And they always end up being a really raging good time. Wouldn't you agree, Anne-Marie? If they are indeed, by our standards, a raging good time. I don't know what that says about us, but there you have it. So welcome. We are very happy to have you. Um, as the sort of title of these webinars suggest, Lemuse Bouche, this is a sort of a little taste of what we do. We really encourage you to ask questions. You are welcome to do that publicly in the chat so that everyone can see or privately. Um, but we really want this to be a didactic experience as much as possible, but that's really up to you in terms of how much you're feeling this morning. But either way, we're going to make sure that you walk away from this experience having been better for spending this time with us. So with no further ado, um, let's get started on talking about this idea of feedback. Um, so before we go much further, this is something you'll see a lot in our training, and it really is for us kind of a basic metric about or, or sort of structure about cognitive behavior and this idea that your beliefs inform how you behave, which creates your reality. So using feedback here in the context of this, for a lot of people, what feedback means is something negative. Um, we often use the phrase like, you know, negative feedback. Why is it negative? Why does feedback have to be negative by definition? Um, so the idea of something that really is neutral and generally positive gets this negative cast. And hence, if you believe that it's negative, if you believe that it's combative, if you believe you have to be defensive, then you behave in a way that is counterproductive to your own growth. What do I mean by that? You're defensive, you ignore it, you get upset, you shut down emotionally. And so you don't actually get to hear what that feedback is and you don't get to actually <laughs> apply it and become better. And we're gonna definitely talk today about the two directions of feedback, both delivering it and receiving it. It is an area for which I think authentic communication and leadership is ripe for connection. And I also think it's an area where people make a lot of mistakes and they create a lot of um, damage. And I don't know, Holly, if you wanna add anything to this. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we see sort of these attitudes and mindsets around feedback. They can be cultural as well. And I mean that from a professional, from a, from a standpoint of a professional culture, you know, um, having practiced law for more than a few years, um, both in a firm setting and in, in an in-house capacity. I think that, you know, the and knowing a lot of lawyers being married to a lawyer, right? Feedback is something that um, is, is often viewed with uh, a, a very defensive sort of uh, perspective from a lot of folks that I know, folks that I work with and myself, frankly, when I was practicing law. And I realized that it, I had to be very intentional about sort of unwinding that, you know, after I stopped practicing law. Um, if you're a litigator in particular, if you have any litigators here, you can just raise your little paw or give me, give me, give me an amen in the chat. You know, you, there's this, this sense that you were supposed to be impenetrable, right? That you're supposed to be bulletproof and you always have all of the answers. And, um, and, and that's, you know, frankly, the, the profession rewards that to a very large degree. But the reality is um, when you are managing people, when you are being managed within a law firm, and if you were not you know, uh, running the show yourself, the chances are you're being managed in some capacity, even if you're an equity partner, right? Um, these mindsets, can, the, a, the, a mindset that, that feedback is negative can really um, be limiting to your professional and your personal growth. And I also will say that, you know, for me personally, I, I noticed when I was sort of entrenched in that, that mindset professionally, it bled over into my personal life as well. Um, you know, and, and feedback became very difficult for me to, um, to meet or manage per, in my personal relationship. So there's a reason that all of you guys decided that you wanted to attend this webinar at 8 a.m. Pacific, right? If you're on, on the West Coast or in the middle of your day on the East Coast um, with us, you could be doing anything else. I would just encourage you to think about right now, um, you know, why that is. Like, why, why, why did this topic intrigue you? Is this something that you've 
struggled with or that has challenged you? And if so, in what sphere of your life, in what capacity? Because I think you have to name the thing before you can really set off to do intentional work around the thing. Yeah, and a couple of things while we're all here, um, I would love for you to drop in the chat um, for everybody, every person listening, I would love for you to just drop in the chat, which do you find harder, delivering or receiving feedback? And you can just say delivering or receiving. Um, and if you'd like to explain why, we'd love to hear that too. But I think it's important for you to identify for yourself, which is harder, because as it turns out, delivering clear feedback is also really rare. Um, and it's rare because it's an act of wild vulnerability to give someone clear feedback requires a lot of courage and most people avoid it. Why do we avoid it? Because we're afraid of how people are going to react. This is why, by the way, you can work in environments where you're working with a total monster. It's because no one, no one has told them that they are a total monster. And I, have to say that a lot of the work we do is about avoidance and tolerance in um, difficult conversations with feedback. What inevitably happens is people will do one of two things. Their two tactics are incredible avoidance. They delay, 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 which is two things I want to say. It's cowardly and it's also out of service to those you lead and work with. It is not a thing you're doing for other people. It's a thing you're doing for yourself. That's a very harsh thing to say. And it's true. We avoid because we want to save ourselves, not because we want to serve somebody else. And if you want to be a quality leader, a quality colleague, a quality human, by the way, I think this is true of all your relationships, then you have to have hard conversations that can sometimes be risky. And the other thing is, I think that it's like we worry that somehow, you know, that we, or we think that if somehow we just keep raising our tolerance, raising our tolerance for a difficult situation, that somehow it will improve. My guess is every single person on this webinar has a conversation that they are avoiding right now, both at work and in their personal life that instead of actually having that conversation, what they're doing is they're raising their tolerance, raising their tolerance. But here's what I always tell people. Tolerance always has a ceiling. It can't go on forever. So at some point you hit that ceiling and there's nowhere to go. We're getting tons of response in the chat. So much good chatting. I love it, I love it. Holly, do you wanna um, check in on some yeah, of Yeah, I do. And, and some of this definitely we will touch on just uh, a, a little bit later, but Lots of you struggle with delivering. Um, one person says that she struggles to be nice and constructive. One person says that they sugarcoat the message. Okay. Uh, one person struggles with clarity in the delivery. I, I really love this one. One person says delivering spontaneous feedback is difficult because she's never sure if people really want her feedback if they don't ask for it. Um, someone doesn't want to offend. Um, one person says that she doesn't, she struggles with receiving. She struggles with not becoming defensive, especially in a 360 context. And then we have this little bit about the, um, I'm just going to say it guys. We're not going to use an asterisk. The shit, the shit sandwich, which is frankly how I was once taught by a boss yep. to deliver feedback. Right. So buffering the real message with something nice. Right. Um, and that is totally one of those modalities. I feel like Anne Marie, I know you and I have talked about this. I'm about, I know, you know, you're about to unleash the Kraken over here. On the the sandwich. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so lots of great feedback and, and it seems like lots of struggles around delivering, but also struggles with not with just defensiveness in, in the reception. Yeah. So we're going to, shift in just a moment about what feedback actually is. But before we do that, let me say something about the sandwich. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the sandwich, if it were, since we are in the la mousse bouche. <laughs> <laughs> the sandwich as, as it is. I don't believe in that because I think it compromises trust. So there's a lot of, I don't know, um, there's just a, there's a whole lot of um, work around trauma and trust and credibility. And I just saw this whole thing on um, this sort of modality about nicety and how like hyper nicety is really a trauma response that you learned growing up. 100%. To see that people's emotions, to make people feel better, to quiet your other, but what it also makes you is it makes you not trustworthy. 
Yeah. So here's the problem with that is when you do this thing where you're like, Hey, I love your jacket and you're a sparkling smile. It's so great. Also, <laughs> you're terrible at this thing. Um, what I think happens is people are smart and they're adults, they're not children. And that kind of thing compromises trust. I think you get a lot further. I know this because I've done it for years and years and years and I've seen it is when you look at somebody in the eye and say, I need to tell you something that's hard and I'm telling you this in service to you because I'm invested um, in your growth and I'm invested in your professional development. And so that's why I want you to know this because I know you wanna be better. That's a very different way to give information than punitively, which is not useful. Never give feedback punitively because then it's about you and not the other person. And it's really as a gift, it should be a gift. And so what we wanna say about feedback is feedback is a gift. You should deliver it and receive it as such, always. And it is most importantly, what we'll say next in the next slide is it's a free education to excellence. And what I will tell you is the people who get the least amount of um, feedback are historically marginalized people. Um, and for all the reasons you can imagine, um, people generally are afraid to give feedback. So that when you're not getting good critical feedback, you are being robbed of your potential for excellence. That's the way we see it. So authentic, good leaders do not shy away from feedback. They deliver it with, with compassion and decency and directness. Um, Holly, do you want to add anything to that? I know that we've got some things going on in the chat as well. Yeah, um, so actually, the person who just asked this question, we're going to answer it now. Um, we, we got a question that's, that sort of dovetails off what you just yeah. said, Anne-Marie. So what if you, what if you identi identify, excuse me, genuine positives to go along with the genuinely constructive feedback? So I think what this person is saying, yeah. what if there are some positives that are legitimate and they're related, um, you know, and you want to throw those in to the perhaps more constructive piece? That's a great question and it's fair. I think that if you're using it and they are actually connected, for, so for instance, I'm gonna give you a for instance. Um, I'm a writer, Holly's a writer. If you've ever been part of a writer's group, typically the rules are say something nice and then say why you think there's a problem with it, right? I'm not against that. I think that there's some value in it if they're connected. What I will say I don't think is useful, and I think, can, but I'll give you a great example of when I think it's so clear to people that it's that those kinds of rules fall apart. Is you get somebody who really needs help in their writing, right? And you're like, hey, I just loved this font. Your font choice was That's so great. Font. It was just clear. It was readable. And obviously, I'm using a really extreme example, but deliberately so to be um, illustrative. Clearly, that isn't really positive feedback. That's just something you're doing to mask the fact that this person's writing needs a lot of help. They are sitting in that room. And in my opinion, your job is to honor them and to say, that, I can't tell you, I've been a writer for years, the number of times I've said the thing that nobody else is saying. And the amount of people who walked up to me and said, thank you so much for that. I really appreciated it. Because they want to be better. People want to be better. And if you are delivering it from a place of compassion, I'm never punitive. I'm never cruel, but I am honest. And I think that there's some real value in that. That doesn't mean that that will totally extract any sting from it. None of us want to hear that there's anything wrong with us. We all want to be perfect and we all want to be fabulous. And I think that if you are earnestly invested in somebody's professional development, they feel it. Um, I think it's rare. I'm going to be honest. I think a lot of managers are not. I think they use it as a tool of, puni uh, of punishment when they're pissed off, when they're disappointed, rather than here are the ways I let's work together to make this muscle a little stronger. Um, so do you want to say anything further about that? Holly? Yeah, yes, I do. I, I think that, you know, I, I can't say enough how, why positioning matters here, you know, and if you notice that little phrase that Anne-Marie said it really quickly, maybe a slide ago, 
but I'm, I'm saying this to you because I'm invested in your personal development. If you're saying that genuinely and authentically, yeah. um, that's, you know, that signals and telegraphs to the person that you're, that you're speaking to that, like, that there is a connection here. I want to see you grow and not just to your point, Anne-Marie, I'm going to throw this feedback at you as some tool of punishment. I mean, I, when I worked in house, I um, had a very strange reporting structure and I reported into an executive that I should not have been reporting into probably. And he frequently would just say things like, you know, you just need to do better in those meetings. Well, you know what? I have no idea what that means and the way that he would lead into those to, to delivering that feedback if we even, if we even want to call it that was clearly from a from a position of he wanted to look better he wanted to uh, he, he felt that he was being judged by my performance in meetings maybe he was right but it was very clear to me that it was all it was an it was a it was centric to him right and he was focused on rather than you know I, I remember going to a meeting in DC with our private equity owner and um, it was very nervous and had made this big presentation. And the GC of the private equity company called me later and she said, Holly, how did you think that that went? And I was like, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't think it went really well. And she said to me, you know, I, I've totally been in that position. Like I recognized it when I saw you. Here are three concrete things that you can do to make that presentation stronger next time. You know, so, so this particular person on the board, these, this is kind of his communication style. When he wants to hear these types of numbers or these types of figures, you know, this type of person, he wants to hear this, right? So she gave me really specific. Yes actionable feedback. And when we do our trainings on executive presence, we talk a lot about feedback because we believe the ability, we know the ability to receive it and deliver it is really central to uh, that concept. But, you know, nobody really teaches you how to do it, right? And and to me, that woman, you know, I, she, she really changed my relationship with feedback and taught me a lot about how to deliver it. But no one else, you know, law school was doing that. No one was doing that within my company. It was not a priority. Um, a, a question that came in that's, that's really good, and I'm going to move the slides along just to, so we can keep pace. Um, this Hughes, your, your question Hughes to this. How is it possible, how to give feedback to your leader? or to someone to whom you report. Is yeah. that possible? I would say, yes, it absolutely is possible. Anne-Marie, you look like you're about to jump on. It is, it is, it is possible. And I wanna say a couple of things. You know, one is like the previous guy who's like, you just need to do better. That's just lazy to me. Right. That kind well, of like feedback, mm -hmm. is just like do better. You need more time. We need more from you. That's just lazy. It's crappy and it's lazy and it's poor leadership. I think that, you know, part of like, and, and the example I always give is like, listen, every Olympic athlete in the world has a coach. And do you know what a coach's job is? To constantly tell you every damn thing you're doing wrong. That is literally their job to say, you need to bend your knees a quarter of an inch more. I need you a little more forward. You need to do, X. that is your job. Your job is to help people be brave enough to do better. And if you can't give feedback, then get the hell out of leadership. It's not for you. It's just not for you. And so I would say in the context of a leader, it can be very difficult. And I'm not going to pretend that it isn't because we don't do training that's like in the land of unicorns and lollipops and candy land. We do real world training. So I think you have to be measured about the kind of person you're dealing with. If you're dealing with an egomaniac or a narcissist, probably not, frankly. Um, but if you're dealing with a good human, I think you can enter that and say in the form of a question is really valuable. So that's always a great way in. So um, usually it's around communication like, hey, I want to better understand this. Are you saying X? Or are you saying Y? You know, I don't know what the feedback is you're trying to give. So it's hard for me to give you particularly what you, uh, you know, precisely how to enter that point. But I will just say that, of course, you can if you have someone who I think is receptive, if you have somebody who's not an egomaniac. I am also just going to say, um, despite popular belief, I don't think a great way to start feedback conversations are. Are you open to feedback? <laughs> and I, I agree. I agree. And I'm going to give you my reason why. And Holly, you can tell me what you think about this. Yeah. I think it creates an immediate tension and negative environment. Yeah. It's like saying, I'm about to tell you something terrible. Do you want it? 
no. <laughs> I just think it doesn't feel, is that how you would give someone a gift? That's my argument. If you see feedback as a gift, you would never say, I have this gift for you. Do you want it? No, you wouldn't. So I know from that phraseology, it's not going to be delivered as a gift. I know it. I know it's, and I would also say, don't give feedback for the sake of giving feedback. Yeah. Give it for the idea of being invested in wanting to make someone better. I think that when you're truly coming from that place and that is profoundly your intention and your purpose, I think it's like we're trying to elevate people, hopefully. And if you're not, if you're just taking pleasure, I remember when I was in college, uh, I, I always remember this little story. I had this friend, Alicia, and we used to work in the cosmetics department at Gottschalk's in Woodland, California, y'all. Um, <laughs> And y'all remember the days when we had to wear pantyhose to work? Does anybody, is yes. anybody here um, of that generation? Because I was. And we had to wear pantyhose. And my friend Alicia would go, don't you just hate when someone tells you you have a hole in your pantyhose? And I started laughing and I said, do I hate it? Why would I hate it? She goes, because they just delight in telling you. I'm like, you're <laughs> at work. What are you going to do about it? And they're like, you have a hole in your pantyhose. This is not useful feedback. Like, okay, I know. What do you want me to do about it? And I always think of that as an example of something that's useless. Like you're pointing something out that nobody can fix or change or do anything about. Like, why are you, like, what is the point of that? So I would just say, and also very, very critically on the side of delivering feedback, um, de deliver it about behavior, not about people. Yeah. That's incredibly important. I don't want you to say to people, you know, I just feel like, you, you are X, Y, or Z. It's not about the person, it's about their behavior. You have to be able to point to behavior because behavior is the thing we can change. And so, you know, you can't change that, you know, I'm too short, I'm too, you know, whatever it is, but really focus on behavior. And again, remember that delivering good feedback is about wild vulnerability. You know, I say this as somebody who does a lot of high level coaching, you know, I'm hired to give feedback to people who often, are no longer getting good critical feedback. That's my job. And so these are people who are still striving for excellence in their profession, even though they are at the top of the hill, they still wanna be excellent. And part of that is trusting someone to give you good quality feedback. So the response to giving feed, uh, to receiving feedback is always the same. It's always thank you. And I really encourage you when you're delivering feedback, we talk about this all the time to open with, I have been you. I have sat there and had to take very hard feedback. The story Holly just told is a great story to say, listen, some, once somebody gave me some really important feedback and it was hard to hear and it was also true and it made me better. And I want to do the same for you. I want to be as brave as that woman was when she picked up the phone and called me. And I want to do that for you. That's a very different way of going in. And I'd also say yes to all that. I would also say two quick things before we move on. Mm -hmm. Um, you, in sort of adopting these behaviors and modeling them, and particularly if you, particularly if you have several people who are reporting into you, you are teaching them how to do it, which is, um, an act of courage and an act of leadership. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because we've, we both, you know, Anne-Marie, I'm sure you have to, we've coached people where they're like, but I just work in this toxic culture. Or I work in this culture where people don't give feedback. Well, guess what? What can you control and within that culture, you can control yourself, right? So um, being able to sort of model, particularly for folks who have never managed before, maybe they don't currently manage, but they will someday, this artful way to deliver feedback uh, in a way that's centered on the other person's development. Um, you know, you will be that that you you will be that person, like in the story that I just told to this, to this, to to those humans, right? I mean, I haven't talked to her, Heather was her name for years, but I remember her and I think about her often uh, because she modeled a wonderful way to give feedback. Um, and I I try I, I think about her very frequently. So I think that is something to remember. And also, you know, feedback, this should go without saying, but feedback should not just be reserved for like review time, right? So it should not just be something that you are getting once a year or giving once a year um, because <clears throat> we've all probably been in those reviews where it's like, 
it's November and they're like, well, Anne Marie, back in January, you failed to file that TPS report. Do you remember that? Who remembers TPS reports? 10, 10 uh, gold stars for anyone who can name that movie. But right, like, I mean, it's, it's you, what can you do about it at that point, right? You want yeah. to be, if you're focused on specific behavioral changes, you are then giving feedback in real time. Yeah, and I would say if the first time somebody is hearing feedback is in a review, you have failed. There's no question of that. It's totally wildly unfair because you have not been stewarding them to excellence along the way. And one other thing I want to say is feedback is not an opportunity for blame. Right. That's really important. I come from a business development background. I see it all the time. Like, it's like, well, we would have gotten this if you, no, 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 that's not what feedback is for and nor should it be. Um, so it's really, really important that you don't use feedback as a tool of blame and you use it and talk about it as an investment tool, as something to be valued and something that's precious. And I would say, you know, I think of us as often some of our work is to humanize the business world and to make it a more compassionate, humane place. I really do believe that. There's a lot of toxicity. There's a lot of abusive cultures. There's a lot of terrible environments. And something that you know I frequently say is we don't allow anybody to use a piece of machinery. We train them because if they don't, they can injure someone or kill them. But we let any fool manage people. And what happens is they say things and treat people in a way that is profoundly harmful. So harmful that it lives with them forever. And we see the scars of this in people well into their career of the, if they were led by somebody who was abusive. And so I think it's really important that you understand that your job is a serious one when you're leading people and when you're working with people. And you will have like that story of how you treated them will remain with them for a very long time to come. And so think about that um, when you're receiving, when you're delivering feedback in terms of receiving feedback, you know, again, I think it's just important that you just say, thank you. Sometimes great people give you terrible feedback. Sometimes terrible people can give you some decent feedback. And it's just the, the delivery isn't great. The other thing I would say is if you're getting what I call non-feedback, which is like, oh no, you're doing great. That's not really feedback and it's not helpful. And if you're trying to get better, it's incumbent upon you to say, hey, thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm really working on X, Y, or Z or and I really want to position myself for this opportunity. It would be super helpful to me if you could tell me how to get better around X, Y, Z. Sometimes you have to let other people know that you desire and are prepared for that kind of feedback and you're seeking it. Any other thoughts about that, Holly? Um, someone just said, I love when people tell me what they are working on or what they want yeah. to work on. Yeah, because I think it's rare, right? I mean, just, just to, I, I think, you know, speaking sort of in the generality here, I, I think that we, live in a culture in which, you know, asking for feedback is viewed as sort of opening ourselves up to be eviscerated in some way, right? And that does not have to be the way that, that it is. I mean, I think, um, but again, it so much, I, I see a lot of wild variation in the ability to, the, the, the uh, desire to ask for feedback, the actual asking and then the reception of, of across industries, you know, and again, like when I was a journalist, feedback co happened constantly. I mean, that is literally what working in a newsroom is, right? You're sitting there and an editor's over your shoulder and he's like, why did you use that word? Why did you use that word? That word sucks. That sentence, I'm killing it. You're like, oh, my word, babies, they're slaughtered, right? But like, that's li literally, I went from that where my relationship with feedback was like, oh yeah, I was hungry. I wanted to be better. And then working in a law firm, I mean, I just have to say, like it, it was viewed as any, any feedback that was not just like, you're doing great, sweetie, or you killed it. It was viewed as weakness, right? And so um, that, it, that can be very difficult to sort of rust yourself away from. You have to be very, very intentional about the asking. And the ability to say thank you when you get it, because some, I would also say one final thing, you know, on, on my part, um, you know, some feedback is useful to you and some isn't, you know, and there's an element of your own personal discretion. I don't know if you would agree with this, Anne Marie, in terms of how you process that, but you have to at least be open, open to receiving it. 
Absolutely. So somebody just said, and I want to really um, acknowledge it. They said that, and I love this language, most people are such a blunt instrument when delivering feedback because we don't give ourselves enough practice. So it can be genuinely risky to ask someone because you may totally get dumped on. Absolutely. I mean, there's no question of that. But again, you, that doesn't mean that that person doesn't have valuable input. And so I have to say, like, I've gotten some really harsh feedback, but inside of it, there was something valuable. And you have to be able to learn to distance yourself and depersonalize it and extract what you can. If your only tool is to avoid that person, you may be robbing yourself of growth. And so it's a balance to think about that. We all want to protect our hearts. And I do think we live in a world, particularly now with social media, where anybody can be behind a keyboard and say the most wretched, horrible things yeah. about someone. And I do think that we also can be in work environments where depending on the culture people came from, you know, they might have come from a work culture in which, you know, this was seen as sort of like, this is one of the things I also like we, I came from a culture and I've, I've written about this. Like we, we believed that like, like we took pride in the fact that you went to work sick. I mean, this like, particularly in this environment is like shocking. Like if you had surgery and you defied your doctor's orders and came back to work earlier, even better. Like you were, you were just rewarded. It was also a culture where it was about abuse most of the time. If you could take somebody who was tough, that made you tough. And it perpetuated this cycle of toxicity and abuse. We still have residues of that in, in, in industries um, where that's true and just companies where that's true. So I think it's just really important to be sort of take control and agency of the way you deliver and receive feedback and think about how powerful of a tool it is. I would just leave with you that you all have somebody who caused you pain in the course of your life, who gave you feedback in a way that sort of scarred you. And it's very hard to admit that, but we all have it and we can all remember it. And it, it's painful to think about. And we all like to think we're above that, but that tells you how powerful that is. Like you, we all have little scars on our heart for somebody who wasn't careful or thoughtful or professional or dignified. And what our work is about is trying to make the world a more compassionate, thoughtful, emotionally intelligent and safe place for everyone. So with that, we thank you very much for joining us. Please stay in touch. We'll be sure to invite you to our very next um, webinar. In the meantime, if you have questions or comments, we would love for you to email us and follow us. And we appreciate you spending your morning with us. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye, y'all.